Our culture and society tell us we are defined by the things we own, the money we collect, our pain and suffering, and our achievements in life. And yet God tells us that our value and worth can be defined by Him. We have been misinformed. All right, good morning, church family. Had an awesome weekend at the Men's Retreat, 85 men out there uh, worshiping the Lord together, having lots of fun, although I do need to confess to you, I'm going to go ahead and say it, a few too many deacons took way too much pleasure in trying to shoot me with an arrow. It, it wasn't particularly fair, and Charles Cool specifically, the deacon chair, he lit me up, all right? And you guys need to talk to him about that, all right? Hey, this morning we have the awesome privilege of uh, taking the Lord's Supper together, okay? And so if you did not grab elements on your way in, you can lift your hand and a deacon will come by and make sure you have those elements But let us begin to prepare our hearts now through the entirety of the service that we are proclaiming the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ, okay? And preparing our hearts, his body broken, his blood, the new covenant. And it doesn't just save us, right? Faith in him saves us, but even more than that, as we've been walking through our new sermon series, he redefines everything about us with the power, the ability to walk out in newness of life. And so the scripture uh, tells us, it presses us, do not take the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner. Right? Prepare your heart so that we might confess our sins and run right back to the foot of the cross and again proclaim that he has made us new and we walk out in newness of life. Amen? All right, turn with me in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. Hold your spot there. We're going to be looking at 17 through 24, as we continue this morning our sermon series that we've titled Misinformed, looking at all the ways um, in each of us in our everyday life that the enemy attacks our identity in Christ and sends confusing messages uh, both from culture and within yourself. So last August, at the beginning of school, a mother posted a social media video complaining that her son identifies as a cat, and the school was not taking her son seriously. They told him to stop licking his paws, and she threatened to sue. Now, needless to say that this video went viral with millions of views and and scores of opinions as the firestorm went on. Opinions from, you know what, this is absurd, to, and I quote, people have a right to think whatever they want to think, and we need to accept people just the way that they are. You say, Pastor, that was actually a parody video. I know. But furries are a real growing thing. That is where people identify with the spirit animal and feel more comfortable in costume and exhibiting animal behaviors, all right? And this confusion is growing in our school system. Secondly, the reasoning is no different from people who suffer from gender dysphoria. And the firestorm that we see in our culture over transgenderism, that's sweeping culture. And we see it everywhere. You don't need me to tell you. The claim, 
I am a woman trapped inside a male's body. I am my desires. That's the identity, the misinformed identity claim that we are going to look at this morning. I am my desires. But what we're going to see is from a biblical perspective that the reason Jesus came, again, was not only to save you, but to redeem you, that he is your new identity, not your desires. Your desires do not define you. Now, before we jump into this, there are a few things that I need to address. First, what I need to say to us as a church is that we are called to be his light in this time and season. That means we are called to think well and to articulate clearly how the gospel answers the questions of the heart. To quote Carl Truman, the task of the Christian is not to whine about the moment in which he or she lives but to understand its problems and to respond appropriately to them. You see, guys, we're called to be salt and light to a lost world. And what we are seeing culturally is the absurd result when your desires define you. Secondly, some of you have expressed concern to me over the topical nature of the sermon series that we're currently in. Well, here's the good news. Have no fear. I have not changed. My regular rhythm and practice will be to walk through books of the Bible. But there are times pastorally where I need the freedom to be able to address specific cultural issues and things that are going on. So after spending a year and a half walking through the book of Acts, and there was a lot that went on in that year and a half, you just gotta know pastorally, there's so much that happens in the cultural firestorm, I'm always like, should I just break rank and preach this sermon this week, okay? So we prayed about this as a pastoral team and really thought that this series, to be able to talk about misinformed identity, was very important to be able to address this. Also, please note, these are still expository sermons. That is, I'm taking a a, a passage of scripture and I'm walking through (coughs) and giving you the truth from that scripture of passage, okay? (coughs) Finally, Now, before we read and pray, today's sermon will begin with a philosophical look of culture, okay, and the lies that we are believing. We, We will look like this, out. But in the end, the sermon's gonna pivot and it's gonna come back to, what does the gospel say to our lives, to our heart? Okay? And we're going to say, Holy Spirit, know my thoughts, search me, expose any false belief in me, and strengthen that my foundation is in you. Okay? So this is not going to be just point the finger, everything must come as a personal reflective of us, church, as we move towards the Lord's Supper. So with that, listen, as I read Ephesians 4, beginning in verse 17. So this I say and affirm together with the Lord, that you no longer walk as the Gentiles walk, in the futility of their mind, being darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardness of their heart. 
And they, having become callous, have given themselves over to sensuality for the practice of every kind of impurity and greediness. But you did not learn Christ in this way, if indeed you have heard him and have been taught in him, just as truth is in Jesus that in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with with the lust of deceit, and that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new self, which is in the likeness of God, has been created in righteousness and the holiness of the truth. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, as we think this morning about the temptation, not only within, but culturally, to be driven and overwhelmed by our desires, a wide range of desires that that change and pivot and move throughout our lives, but Father, it is so important that we see the truth of your son, that your son came not only to forgive, but to redeem our desires and to give us a new identity so that we can walk out, God, not not driven by our flesh, but able to overcome even the desires that remain within So Father, help us to understand that with clarity this morning and help us to understand the power that is available in your son, in Jesus' name. And help us as a church to shine that light, that truth to a culture around us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, so I'd like to begin with a very simplistic, even insultingly simplistic overview of how we got here. If, if you desire, you can email me and I will send you lots of books that you can read along these topics to try and think through this. But I'm gonna do a super quick flyover. If you begin with ancient philosophy, Plato and Aristotle, the, the Greeks and the Romans, almost extensively, everyone widely recognized the need to order higher virtues. That within man, you have an array of desires, many of them base and primal. And there is a need for every one of us to suppress certain desires in order to achieve higher order virtues like courage and justice and self-control. Well, as Christianity sweeps through the Roman Empire and and moves west, great thinkers like Augustine reorient now this foundation upon Christian virtues with the understanding that humans have distorted desires. We either love the wrong things or we love the right things in the wrong order. But it's very important that you understand that the West was founded upon a biblical worldview, okay? And and all the discussion that's taken place over the last 300 years has been standing on the shoulders of Christianity. Well, then comes along the Age of Enlightenment in the 17th and 18th century. And the shift in the Age of Enlightenment is to Focus on reason through the scientific method. The highest order is reason through the scientific method. And the thread that I want to pick up for us this morning, coming out of enlightenment, is their conclusion that there is no spiritual realm. There is no God. There is no intrinsic meaning within nature. Therefore, humans are not spiritual and they have no uh, special meaning. As Darwin concludes, right, we are merely evolved monkeys. And catch this, because science cannot prove morality, 
Okay? You understand that science can't, whether something is right or wrong, science can't test that. By the time Nietzsche is done, morality is nothing more than personal preference. Okay? So let me give you an example real quickly. During the 2008 presidential campaign, an ABC News uh, published an article <coughs> about young evangelicals. And the reporter had been to a Christian youth rally in New York. Now, the good news of this is that <coughs> these young uh, evangelicals expressed a strong commitment to biblical ethics. Most of them were pro-life, even ranking abortion as their number one political issue. But then there was this strange disconnect. Many of those same teens said that their favorite political candidates were pro-choice. Now to the reporter, this sounded like a contradiction, a case of cognitive dissonance. Doesn't that bother you, he asked? Well, maybe a little bit, one teen replied. But it's all personal preference. I mean, you really can't pass judgment on someone because that's their belief. You see, in our culture, moral convictions have become all personal preference. To quote Jonathan Grant, modern authenticity encourages us to create our own beliefs and morality. The, the only rule <coughs> being that they must resonate with who we feel we really are. The worst thing that you can do is conform to some moral code that's imposed on you from the outside by society, our, <coughs> by our parents or the church or whoever else. No, it is deemed self-evident that any such imposition would undermine our unique identity. The authentic self believes that personal meaning must be found within ourselves or must resonate with our one-of-a-kind personality. All right, so hold on to that truth. That is this lie, sorry, hold on to that lie. That is that morality is a personal preference. That, that truth is inside of us. Next, we need to insert the influence of Sigmund Freud. By the way, most of his work has been completely debunked, but it's impossible to overestimate the influence that he has had. Before Freud, sexual desires were acts that you performed but they were not in any way who you were. But for Freud, you are at your core a sexual being. And one's sexual appetites is his identity. And the repression of desire is the basis for all neurosis. In other words, the reason that you are unhappy is because someone else is telling you what you cannot do. So freedom and happiness for Freud is sex without repression. And throughout the 20th century, as technology improves, mainly uh, birth control, th there's the removal of natural consequences that leads to the sexual revolution. Now, if you want to look at something absolutely insane, look up the Kentler experiment. Uh, Helmut Kentler was a German psychologist and sexologist who gained influence, okay, in Germany because he posited the reason that, that Nazi Germany happened was because there was too much sexual restraint. That's why that happened. And, the, and if the Germans wanted to prevent that from happening again, what they needed was the sexual revolution. <clears throat> All right, so now piece these two lies together. Truth is relative. It is a personal preference. Truth is inside of you. And your sexual appetites define you. And that's how you get where we are today. 
where suddenly in culture, the highest virtue is being your true, authentic self. Live your truth. Have you heard that? Be true to you. Or we sing, I'm free to do what I want any old time. And if you love me, you will agree with me. And you will support my truth. Otherwise, you're a hateful bigot. Do you guys remember just a couple weeks ago when we were in Genesis chapter 3? Remember that silly scene with that talking snake and that tree? And I begged you to see its magnificence. Because when we walk through that tree, remember Satan frames God as a cosmic party pooper who is holding out on you. He is not giving you your best life. And the tree of the knowledge of good and evil represents man's own declaration that I will declare truth for me. Not God, I declare truth. Truth is in me. Do you see how that scene looks now? Do you see how magnificent it is? You see that that was written 3,000 years ago? And look at it. Believer, let us turn our attention, right, to God's word and God's instruction in Ephesians 4. Look at verse 17. So this I say and affirm together with the Lord, that you no longer walk as the Gentiles walk, in the futility of their mind. You see, the lost man's thinking is so distorted. It is marked by futility. His God is his appetite, sex and drink, solely pleasure. Verse 18, being darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardness of their heart. See, the lost man is alienated from God because of the ignorance within. Truth is not within. Ignorance is. Distorted reality, competing desires. And the delusion is due to the hardness of the heart. Verse 19, and they having become callous, right? That is, they've lost sensitivity to God. Having become callous, have given themselves themselves over to sensuality for the practice of every kind of impurity with greediness. They're callous, right? They've lost the capacity to feel shame or embarrassment. And the proof of it is that there are no restraints in their behavior. They plunge themselves into degrading activity, every kind of impurity, like animals, in ignorance of the fact that they have, they are image bearers of God. You've been made in the image of God. Why do you behave such way? Beloved, Paul wrote this 2,000 years ago to the church in Ephesus. But it's like he's looking at our social media. You see, there's nothing new under the sun. Look at all of our progress. Ephesians was a culture that was caught up in sorcery, in infanticide. They didn't have abortion, but when they didn't want their children, they would expose them. They would leave them out to die. It's actually Christians who changed that and challenged that. The Ephesians had temple prostitution, wild sexual perversion. But do you know what happened in Ephesus? Revival. The gospel came and saved people, shined a light and darkened hard hearts, okay? heard the voice of the Holy Spirit and the truth that's found in Jesus, and they were saved. 
And God called believers out of this perversion into to newness of life. And this is the letter that we have where Paul is writing back to them, giving them instruction to those called out ones. Verse 20, but you did not learn Christ in this way. If indeed you have heard him and been taught in him, just as truth is in Jesus. Truth doesn't reside in you. It certainly doesn't, desi- uh, uh, it doesn't reside in your desires. It resides in Jesus. He embodies truth. He teaches truth. And every one of our desires must be filtered through him. Right? So if the whole world is looking at porn on your phones... And Jesus says, for you to look and to lust after a woman in your heart, that is a sin. Then guess what? It's a sin. It's a sin. It is not good for you, and it separates you from a holy God. Verse 22, that in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self which is being corrupted in accordance with the lust of deceit, that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new self, which is in the likeness of God and has been created in righteousness and in holiness of the truth. So if you follow the movement from from 17 forward, right? It's that your desires don't define you. Jesus does. Right? He's given you the new self in the likeness of God. That's why he came. That's why he put his spirit inside of you to redeem you to, 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 so that you could walk out. You are in Christ. In Luke chapter 7, Jesus was invited to a dinner party at a Pharisee's house named Simon. They sit down, and I'm sure this is a big deal for Simon to have this now well-known traveling rabbi come around, and suddenly in walks a woman, uninvited. Everyone knew who she was because she was a sinner, probably a prostitute, and she walks in uninvited, finds Jesus reclining at the table and begins to wash his feet with her tears and hair and then pulls out her most expensive possession, an alabaster veil of perfume, like a year's worth of wages and begins to anoint his feet with that fragrance. And Simon sees this, and he says, obviously Jesus is not the Messiah, not a prophet, because this woman is a sinner. If he knew who she was, He wouldn't have anything to do with her. But Jesus knew who she was. He knew it all. But he did not define her by that sexual activity. No, he knew that those were distorted desires from who she was, that she was an image bearer of God and that he had come to redeem and to restore and to set her on a completely new path. And her actions that day clearly demonstrate that she had repented and believed. So when you get to the end of that story, he says to her, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. You see, her sinful desires do not define her. Jesus does. 
Jesus is her new identity. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers, none of them will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of God. In other words, you have a new identity. He's called you out. So look back at Ephesians 4.22. Notice this, this is so important, that the Christian now has the ability to obey God in his desires. But it requires laying aside, putting off the old self, the old desires. Guys, do you know what that implies? The old desires are still there, okay? Even after someone gets saved, the flesh, the selfish appetites that used to control us do not magically disappear. But the Christian is now free to put off those desires. 1 Corinthians 10, 13, no temptation has overtaken you. Such what is common to man And God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will provide a way of escape so that you will be able to endure it. Sexual temptation, addiction, greed, coveting stuff, anger, your sharp tongue, all of those fleshly desires, you now have the ability to put that off. And God has promised the power to do that. He's promised a way of escape. And you are now free to renew your mind. This means because the spirit of God is inside of you that you can put your finger on issues of the heart that are still wrestling in there and you can clearly understand them and then your mind can be renewed by the word of God. That you can be renewed Beloved, I I can share with you that in my few years of ministry, I personally know dozens of men who've shared the struggle with me that they struggle with same-sex attraction. Many of them married, many of them sexually abused as children. I've walked with them and seen them lay aside the old self, be renewed in their mind and with the truth of God's word, and I've seen them put on the new self in Christ. Because we have deacons, okay, who were former alcoholics, enslaved to that desire. Many members who are former porn addicts and have been able to walk out because the Christian is now free to put on Christ. That is to change clothes, to take off the dirty old garments and to put on the new clean garments of Christ. And listen to me, it requires both, the putting off and the putting on. You cannot just put on new clothes over uh, dirty old clothes and think you're going to smell good. And you cannot simply take off the old clothes. You'd be naked. You got to put on the new ones. So listen, this is what this means. That you must put off the old 
That is to put safeguards and discipline in place to stop doing the old habits. You have to fight the fight, okay? You have to stop putting yourself in compromising situations, okay? You have to Find people that love you and know you and will hold you accountable. You have to take off. That's what it says. Take off. Those desires are still there, but you must master them with spiritual discipline. But if you only focus on taking off, you will fail. Right? If you sit around and go, I'm not going to sin, I'm not going to sin, I'm not going to sin. Dang it, I sinned. You have to put on. This means pursue Christ. Find a greater affection. Right? Seek him. Read his word. Worship in song. Be encouraged by other believers. You have to put on Christ in the positive sense. And and there will be moments in your life where this happens moment by moment. It is a struggle. It's not always that way, but there will be intense moments of battle where you must hunker down and win that war. One of the greatest lessons I ever learned about faith in my life was the lesson of my father quitting smoking. My father smoked from his teenage years well into his 50s, two packs a day, okay? And he hated it, he hated it, and we hated it. And like good family members, we told him often, how much we hated it. But he tried everything he could to quit. All right, I'm I'm talking about decades of trying to quit. And we tried all sorts of things, from a filter that you put on the end of the cigarette, right, to patches, to nicotine gum, to uh, hypnosis, all right, to a a computer program that, that tells you all of this stuff. Shots, we did it all. But he couldn't quit. He was a slave to sin. And then one day we got into, I I was a teenager. Uh, I was about 16, I think. Uh, We we were having a financial crisis, a a tough time. Uh, My parents had a t-shirt cart at the mall and uh, had a really tough season. I I found this out later, right? They shelter it from the kids, but my dad's looking at the financials, like really hard financial season. And so here's my dad. Uh, God, if you get us through this financial, there's no way we can get through this. I'll quit smoking. All right. Now, the part of this story I'm not recommending is that you make deals with God where you like, that's not good theology. All right. I'm just telling you, this is what happened. So God came through. All right. And Somehow they made it financially. And so here's my dad now saying, okay, thank you, Lord, but now I've got to quit smoking. I'm talking, he's never, 40 years, a chain smoker. And now he's got to quit smoking. And here's how he did it. He simply told God, God, I, I need your help you are going to have to take away this desire. And he, he would give testimony. He would tell me, there were times where it was, it was minute and one minute later. The urge would come and he would just cry out, God, you've got to help me. You've got to take this away. And he said he would. And it doesn't feel very victorious when 30 seconds later it comes back. He's like, God, you've got to take this away. And he never had another cigarette the rest of his life. Now, he didn't use theological terms, right? He didn't say, my desires don't define me. He didn't say, Jesus, help me put off the old man and put on the new. But that's what he was doing. That's what he was doing. So, beloved, as we now transition to the Lord's Supper, 
I want you to prepare the bread. And I want you to remember his body was broken so that you could put off the old. His body was broken so that you could put off the old. That debt has been paid in full. And you now have the freedom to walk out. So I'm going to give you just a few moments, but let me ask you, what has the Spirit of God been convicting you of this morning? that you need to walk out of. Whatever it is, confess that to him. Find forgiveness and freedom right now at the foot of the cross. While they were eating dinner, Jesus took some bread and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples and he said, take and eat. This is my body. Beloved, now I want you to prepare the cup. And if with the first part we thought about putting off the old and the freedom from the old. With the cup this morning, I want you to think about putting on the new. Christ has given you himself. He is near for you. He's given his spirit to indwell you. He doesn't leave you in your sin. He empowers us to walk out in freedom and in victory. So before we take this, I want to give you just a moment. And I want you to celebrate. I want you to rejoice that Christ is in you. And in the same way, at dinner, he took a cup, he poured it out, and he told his disciples, this is the new covenant in my blood. Take and drink in remembrance of me. Will you pray with me? King Jesus, we bow before you. There is no one greater than you. You have come that we might have life. You have come that we might have life in abundance and to the full. You have come as our identity with strength and power, not only to forgive, but to redeem and to allow us to walk out in newness of life. 
to even overcome common temptations and desires that have been there in our, in our lives for as long as we can remember. You are greater still and you overcome. And we believe and we trust in your ability to help us walk in newness of life. Jesus, we want to walk worthy of you. We want to know you more. We want to declare that you are better. And it is in your name we pray. Amen. Church family, as the praise team comes and leads us in a final song, it is a chance for you to now respond in a different way, right? You've been responding through the Lord's Supper as you've taken those elements, right? You've been reflecting and laying that at the foot of the cross. But now I want you to stand and I want you to sing in celebration. I want you to sing in faith for what he has done for you. If you have a a prayer need of any sort, we'll have a team of ministers down here at the front who would love to pray with you, okay? If you still have a burden that you need to talk to someone about, come. We are here as a family to to carry one another's burdens. If you want to use these uh, steps or the stage as an altar just to sing and to pour out your heart before the Lord in obedience and gratefulness for what he has done, you are free to do so. Just please, please respond to the Spirit of God however he has pressed you this morning. Would you stand?